Um, so I will talk about voting in the thousand brains theory. Um, and just as context, this is kind of the second in our series of kind of um, meetings that where we're answering sort of new, we have a bunch of new people here and they're uh, asking questions about different aspects of what we've done in the past. So this is second in that series and we might do more of this. Um, so last week we did Den rights and explained uh, to our group, you know, how that stuff works. And here I'm gonna focus on voting based on uh, you know, request. And the reason I did dead rights in part was because I think some of that material is important to understand exactly how voting works, or at least our proposal of voting. But as I started putting this together, I realized there's so much to this, just to even understand voting. Uh, I hope people will get it. I'm not, I don't know. Um, but there's a lot to understand. Uh, you you, you, you of realize it. that we don't understand it well, or you realize that there's a lot of stuff we do understand it's hard to convey? The latter. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> to convey voting, I really have to sort of explain, you have to kind of understand cortical columns and how we approach this whole idea of sensory motor models, and then to understand the details, you have to understand the anatomy and how neurons work and all of this stuff is just, Again, I put this, these slides together this morning, uh, just like last week. So I hope it's not too confusing, but I'm afraid it might be confusing. So, and I'm also saying that in part, I felt like last week I didn't get enough questions and I feel like people are still confused about gun rights. So this today, please don't hesitate to ask the dumb questions because there's a lot of stuff that we just take for granted uh, here. Um, so really do ask dumb questions. And if no one asks dumb questions, I'll be really disappointed. Yeah, I can take up my role. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you already asked him. <laughs> um, so, so, so what I did here is um, to go back to the Collins paper, and we had a, we've had a bunch of slides in the past uh, and posters and things like that, and sort of slapped together a bunch of material from past presentations. So I'm hoping there's a consistent flow here, but there might not be. But really, to understand voting, you know, you need to understand this paper, and then. To really understand the algorithm, you have to understand uh, details about neural function and some of the materials and methods we presented at the end. Um, but there were, there's a lot to the paper. And to me, this is really the core of the thousand brains theory in some sense. Uh, this is really about cortical columns, how they're independent uh, sensory motor modeling systems and how the whole system is put together. So at a macro level to me, this, this really is kind of the foundation for the thousand brains theory. So there's a lot, lot in here. Okay, so I thought we'd start with, in the paper, we, we had this uh, black box thought experiment. This is a quote from our paper. Um, and uh, maybe it's useful to kind of start there just as, as this thought experiment. And Jeff often talks about this in, in, in his talks, but the way we phrase it I here is- I wrote this sentence, I don't know. Uh, you, you probably did. <laughs> um, and, it's a slightly different from what you talk about normally in your talks, but here the idea is, suppose you reach your hand into a black box, right? So you can't see what's in there. All you can do is feel what's in there. Uh, and you're trying to determine what object is in the box. For example, a coffee cup. And there's two different scenarios we're gonna consider. So the first one is you're trying to recognize the object with one figure. figure. And so imagine you, you reach in there, you get some sensation with one sensation, you have no idea what it is. There could be a hundred possible objects, let's say, um, but you get some sensation and you can, you can narrow down what it is. You, can, you know it's not a tennis ball, for example, um, you know, but you know it's probably something smooth and curvy with just one touch, but you don't really know exactly what it is. And to recognize what it is, you would move your finger around, uh, get a number of different sensations. And as you move things, you know, the idea of what that object is will coalesce in your head and pretty soon you'll be able to recognize uniquely what it is. And so does that scenario make, make sense? Uh, and there it's important to note that you're getting one sensation at a time. You're integrating the evidence you had from the past into your next set of hypotheses. And the motion is actually critical. By moving things around, you understand where the relative position of different point uh, sensations are in, in the thing. So, to distinguish a copy cup from some other ceramic object, um, you know, you really need to know the relative locations of, of things. Imagine if you just weren't moving your finger and the same sensations changed in the same way as if, as if you were moving your finger. So 
that is, if, if you didn't know how your finger was moving, you just felt this changing sensation in your fingertip would you'd be clueless. Yeah. Imagine I created some weird object that's made out of components of a coffee cup, but just <laughs> in a completely bizarre location. You would know that as soon as you started moving. But if you just looked at the sensation, you wouldn't be able to tell. So that's the main, that's sort of one um, scenario. The second scenario, oh, and I, with the first scenario, I should mention from a cortical column perspective, uh, the sensation you're getting from, let's say, a fingertip is going into one cortical column and it's integrated over time. Okay. Uh, the second scenario is the multiple cortical column scenario. Suppose you put your entire hand in and you grasp the object. Um, now you're recognizing the object with multiple fingers. It could be two fingers, it could be all five fingers, it could be two hands. Uh, but the more fingers you use, the quicker you're going to recognize it. In many cases, just one grasp is enough. You can instantly tell what's happening. But remember that each cortical column is just getting one of those sensations. So no single cortical column has all the information. So you have to integrate the information or accumulate the information information across multiple cortical columns in order to make that inference. Um, and that's primarily what the voting algorithm is doing. Even within the cor single cortical column, there's still a voting thing going on within a single column. So we'll go into that. So the, actually the same algorithm is used, same voting algorithm is really used in both scenarios. But you can, you can understand now with multiple cortical columns, you can very, very quickly grasp uh, I understand that. I think what you're saying is I, we've never said that before about voting occurring in the comp. I think what you're saying they can vote over time. Yeah. A single column can you use the voting algorithm over time versus, is that what you meant by that? Um, I meant something a little stronger. So that's true. I meant something a little stronger. The, the code that's running or the neuron model that's implicit is identical in both okay. cases. Right. It's not a separate, it's the yeah. same but we, operations. I, 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 I would not use that. I, mean, I haven't used that one. Uh, that would be departure to say, oh, the single column is also voting. I, I, that would be very confusing the way I've oh, been I describing see. it. To okay. I've always used voting across columns, between columns. Right. And right. so I think it's a, a more refined thing to say it's the same algorithm as that play, yeah. but voting requires two people to vote usually. Okay. Two okay. or more. Yeah, that, that's good. <laughs> um, a single vote is not usually a vote. It's yeah. A, and and even with multiple cortical columns, you might need multiple sensations. You, you you don't always recognize it in one sensation, but in all cases, the okay. We, I can be more specific. Then the voting is across cortical columns within the cortical column. That'll be uh, you know it's inhibition. It's the, same, the same algorithm. Yeah. Yes. Um, and the final thing I want to say here at a high level is we'll use touch as the example, but the model is not specific to touch. This is something. Conversations with other people, people often get confused about this. It applies to all inputs to all cortical columns everywhere in the neocortex. And so, the, what the actual input is can vary dramatically from depending on where you are in the neocortex. But it's the it's the same microcircuit, same algorithm, if you will, that's going on uh, in here. It's especially confusing to people regarding vision. Is people for, for ages have thought about vision incorrectly. They thought about vision as oh, we're processing this image, and um, and therefore movement. You can recognize an image with a single flash in front of you. Therefore, movement's not important for vision, and um, that is going to be hugest red hair. Um, and and when you think about touch, and then you realize how movement's essential. And, and if you think about vision as each individual column is just seeing a little part of the world like through a straw, then you realize that there's like a lot of things all at once. Um, so this is, people get confused about vision. They say, well, vision's not like this. Vision is like, you know, you're processing this image. No, the brain does not process an image. Each column processes a little piece of uh, visual point in the world, just like fingers. This would be a good opportunity for someone to ask a dumb question. <laughs> this is, okay. uh, I just want to make sure this scenario More about is clear. Hearing. <laughs> hearing is a little bit less obvious, um, but, but what's clear is from the anatomy in the brain, it's the same, right? Um, and, but it's, you know, the, the topology of your, of the representation of your, your skin and your brain is very, very clear. It's, oh, each part of my skin has its own little column they're arranged in this little homunculus body state. And you can say, oh, each part of my retina has its own column. It's like a little part of the visual scene. When you get to hearing, 
the topology of the cortical columns is in, is in, in frequency domains and other things. And it's a, it's a little bit harder to just look at it and go, oh yeah, that's just like, you know, um, that's just like vision. You know? and, uh, but the anatomy suggests it is, and we haven't spent a lot of time trying to analyze vision, to explain, but there's a lot that's known about um, not anatomy, but it, it's clearly operating on the same principles, but in a different sort of dimensional space. So um, we don't really understand it, but it's going to be the same. The, the core of this is, is being able to make predictions as you do motor actions, being able to predict the sensory input that's coming in. Uh, so that's at the core of a lot of this, and that has been shown even in the auditory cortex. I, uh, that David Schneider and others have done experiments where they can record from auditory cortex and show that there are neurons that are, uh, I don't know if, it's, if this experiments are fully done, if it's public, but as, as you make footsteps, for example, you're predicting the sound that you're going to get as you move. And so those predictions are happening in the auditory cortex. So that's, what, yeah, uh, you want to think about like the sensor, you can think, okay, there's, the vision is it's an array of, uh, you know, uh, sensory uh, sensors. It's all part of that. Huh? And your skin is an array of sensors. The array of sensors in, in the ear, of course, is the cochlea, which is, a, you know, a, a, this strip of material where you have uh, frequencies represent high frequencies one and low frequencies at the other. End. So that's that is the topology of that sensory organ. It's not in some sort of uh, projection onto two dimensional space like. The touch and, and, and vision. Um, but there is that same sort of topology. So, a column in, one column in the auditory cortex will be looking at certain frequencies and there's other attributes too. It's much more complicated than that. Um, but that, that was going back to the point I made earlier. It's, it's, it's the same basic process, but less intuitive as to how you how it's representing the world. But it is definitely a sensory motor system. And not only that, when you hear, you're often turning your head and cocking your ears, and you don't even know you're doing this. But every time you move your head a little, just a little bit, you're changing the sounds, and um, and and that's how you differentiate things when you're having trouble understanding something. You turn your head, you turn it like this, you go head again, and as you're doing that, it's a sensory motor integration process. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it's clearly the same thing. So when we say prediction based on motor command, we're also including like small movements and the saccades. These are also motor commands. Oh yes, yeah, saccades are definitely like yeah. the core of the whole thing. Uh, those aren't little, you know, they change the input completely um, um, dramatically. So, yeah, all of that. And of course, everywhere you look in the cortex, the, the part of the visual cortex projects back to the part of the brain that moves the eyes. And of course, the somatic sensory cortex is right next to the part that moves your limbs. And auditory cortex projects back to like the part of your, uh, your spinal cord, which turns your head. So, the, the, there's clearly the sensory part of like. The, Question about the touch. There's a difference between a touch like this and a touch like this. Yeah. So when we talk about just the single touch, not the continuous touch. You know we talk about this a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you're, not, you're, just, you're not asking a question, you're making a statement. <laughs> I think this probably gets to some of the flow issues. Yeah, it does get to some of the flow issues, right? Because what we know is when you touch something, there are different sensors that are active. I think Marcus did a lot of presentation on this one. There's different sensors that are active when you're moving your finger along something versus you're touching something. Um, the, there's multiple ways to think about that, but one is uh, that even even that flow is a way of telling your, your the brain how the how the sensor is moving. When when there's a there's a signal coming back, says, oh yeah, this thing's moving across your skin at, at certain at certain velocity. That's not to recognize something moving in the world. That's to tell you how your finger is moving. <laughs> it's not the only way. But, um, so whether you, you're touching staccato or whether you're doing continuous one, there's a temporal component to it. If the, I'm trying to figure out if when you're doing a single touch, are multiple cortical columns moving amongst themselves as to what they just felt, or is it isolated in one? Cortical column. If it is, what is the temporal integrative? So that that's negative? the first scenario. That so that so just repeating what I said earlier. If you, in the first scenario, it's only a single cortical column getting sensation, okay. not multiple. So and right. it integrates that information over time. So as you're reaching into the black box and you sense something, then you sense something else, then you sense something else. 
that's three sensations coming in temporal sequence into a single cortical column, and it has to integrate all of those into this. So, so this is my one question is, what is the integrative mechanism? That's what I'll get to. That's okay. the, uh, that's, what the gotten, that's what the talk is about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the mapping then to one cortical column to a finger? So what you're saying, I was going to ask how many yeah, cortical columns, well, and, you know, yeah, what does that look like it, over time? It's, it's much, it's very complicated, but okay. if you were to look in the cortex, there will be, I have this figure I showed, they show the monkey's hand. Yeah, I'll thing? pull it up. There are six little circles. Each of those little circles is getting, is going to get put to a particular column. So actually the tip of your finger might be multiple columns. All right. But we don't want to think about that. We want to, we want to understand how a single column would work. All right. Um, and, and it should work independently. And it'd be just like touching a teeny little part of your finger, you know. Um, so that's, you know, the, on the monkey's hand, six, you know, six columns wide or something like that. So, All right. And that's less acuity than on your fingertip. So it's so, so, so the, the, the fidelity of the area, right? Yeah, so, yeah. And is this the image? Yeah, that's okay. the image there. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, so this is not showing fingertips, it's showing some, like the, the palm or something. Yeah. Yeah. Back of the hand. yeah. So you can, so the, the sensations here go into cortical column six, and the sensations here go into cortical column one. So if you were trying to figure something out from that, you basically have six dudes voting. Well, so yeah, 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 right, right. All right. Yeah. Those are in a line. Yeah, yeah. And um, I don't know if he has another. And the same thing happens in. It's pretty cool. Yeah, vision. Uh, here's another example of. Uh, yeah, we that one. That's, that was a good one. Yeah, that's. Can you send out the link to this as well? Uh, yeah, maybe if someone can go, keep go to the next. Yeah, yeah. The I'm second, the second one you you showed there. The next one, one of the multiple hand, the hand open. First, you keep going. That one there. You can see. I I, I don't remember exactly this figure, but I imagine those numbers are representing different columns. Yeah. And and, and to, to be honest, a lot of these columns overlap. Some are have a bigger area and a smaller area. This is true in vision too. You might have a. a, a uh, in V1, you have a column that's getting in from a very small part of the retina, and then a column in V2 is getting in from a larger part of the retina. So to be honest, when you just activate one spot, you might be getting multiple columns of different sizes. So you can look there, he's got like, you know, one, two, three, nine, eight or so all on that tip of that finger, or the three, four, five, six, seven. So there are actually multiple columns that are overlapping at this point. So technically, yes, they would be voting, um, but we don't want to think about it that way. Initially, we want to understand what a single column does yep. and then how they vote. Yep. No, that's pretty cool that they've mapped it down to that. Yeah, so I have a question. When he published that, I didn't know that you had the discriminative ability to basically lay a, a an array across a section of any part of the cortex and get a definitive. They didn't do an array. They did, they did multiple probes. recordings. Single, single probes. Single probes. Single this probe. is painstakingly done across lots of experiments. Okay, so you're stabbing the cortex multiple times. Well, go back, go back to the previous slide. He showed the electrode here. Yes, yeah, so look at the top. Is he see one, two, three, four, five, six? That diagonal line is the electrode, represents the electrode. He's stuck in the cortex at an angle. So they would slowly move it, to do recordings, move it a little bit more, do recordings, move it a little bit more, and so on. I see. So a single probe over time could would transcend six columns. And that what they noticed was all the cells in one millimeter of area all responding to one patch of skin and then they abruptly changed to in column two to all the columns in that next millimeter representing the next patch over and so on. This left figure might be also useful. Here the similar, you know, the probe is coming in this way. And so now he's recording from if you can see my screen, multiple cells within a single cortical column. So this is like all one cortical column. So multiple cells within a single cortical column and as he's recording from there you see that it's corresponding to the same patch of skin these are the rf receptive fields of those different cells and then suddenly when it crosses a boundary it shifts over and now you got a whole bunch of neurons that are responding to a neighboring uh, patch of skin just just curious uh, how much damage are these probes doing as you keep very little uh, <laughs> actually very little um um, I mean, they're not like, I don't, no one thinks that they're damaging the tissue so you won't get good results. So that somehow it's weaving its way between the Yeah, yeah, cells. and, 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 it's, and it's recording from many cells at the same time, and it's a very skinny little wire, and it's just being pushed between the cells. This is part of the trick of doing these experiments. There's a whole arc in how to do this, probably. Right. And you can, if you're not careful, you can get all these um, 
antibodies and stuff that form around it and because right, you know, right. it's scar tissue is trying to heal itself right. all sorts of stuff happens so you, they have to do this properly in some sense anyway that, that technique is is uh i don't think it's damaging to data this is off topic we're off topic already this is the definition of a cortical column. If you look in the cortex, you will not see cortical columns. I say this all the time. You won't see those other lines on the left there. You know, those, those radial lines that, that ones, they yeah. don't exist. The definition of a cortical column is this exact picture. It's that the cells in one square millimeter or so all respond to one thing, and then they abruptly jump and respond to something else. And that is the definition of a cortical column. Uh, another question to the, the slides you have. So there, you say those two options are basically the same voting mechanism, um, but the first one kind of seems a lot more active to me. So you can actively decide where to move next to resolve the most uncertainty, for example, and you uh, need to know when do I have enough information to take the boat or to be certain that there's this object and with the second one you kind of have one sensation from multiple places but it's not like actively sampling the environment do you but in, yeah there in, in the second case you're much much faster at recognizing it so in many cases in just one grasp you will do it but imagine you were doing it with let's say two fingers you know you might still need to make movements so you know, it sort of depends how ambiguous the situation is. I think maybe and also I think this is getting to the point I made earlier. I, I don't think we should call the first situation voting. It's, it's I think you know, uh, saying the same as neural stuff on it. The first situation is not voting, it's sensory motor integration. Um, the cortex is deciding where to move the finger. That's part of its algorithm. The second situation is really I at, at any point in time, each column knows something and they're trying to they're trying to resolve their differences. So if you just think of that as such situation number two is, is where voting occurs and situation number one is a different process. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's sensory motor integration is within a column. But, but one finger has multiple parts of the column, right? So okay. one finger has multiple well, parts of the column. We're, we're, we're exactly up to one. Okay. 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 We're just, yeah, there's one part of the column. Let's imagine this one. Each column is doing the same thing. Let's say we have one. It's, it still can work. That's sort of like the fundamental premise here is that quarter columns are identical or, or very, very close in their functionality. Each one is a complete system. Therefore, we need to understand how a single one works or multiple ones work. Um, there's no magic that occurs when you go from one to two. You know, it's not like you have, each one has to stand on its own. Oh, okay. So, you know, the first to look at the first part of it, it how, how can a cortical column learn predictive models of sensory motor sequences? So, what is what are the algorithms? Um, in the neuron paper, we discussed the sequence memory, and we reviewed that a little bit last week. Um, the idea there is you have a whole bunch of uh, pyramidal neurons laid out in many columns. Um, Just to be clear, these are not these are not. Quarter columns here. These this are not, is one. This is one layer of cells in one cortical column. Yeah, this whole thing is one cortical column. It's one, it's one layer of cells. In one one, column. Yeah, one layer of cells in one cortical this column. One, we're just looking at things look like this. We call them cortical yeah. columns. These are mini columns. These are, different. these are mini columns, and all the neurons within a mini column have the same feedforward receptive field. Uh, so it gets sensory input coming in from the drug is coming in from below here in green. That's the feedforward input that's coming proximally into the cells. Um, in addition, there are a whole bunch of uh, lateral connections. Let me just um, there are lateral connections across the cells, and these uh, go into the distal dendritic segments, um, and these act as uh, context and allow the cell to make predictions based on the feed forward input. So this is what we had kind of described a little bit last time. And if you look at the cortical anatomy, um, you know, we're saying the sensory feature comes into, let's say, layer four, um, and you know, that's what a, a sensory feature, but there's another big input coming in that's almost half of the input into layer four is coming in from lower layers. And so, you know, 
when we were discussing this, this was, you know, this was an unexplained anatomical fact at that point, at that point in time, right? And what is going on in here? And so what Jeff sort of hypothesized is that suppose we had a motor related context signal, let's say allocentric location. We've talked a lot about this since then, but at that time it was just some motor related context signal. Suppose it comes in here and acts the same way as these lateral signals did in the temporal memory. If you, if this represented the, the external location, the allocentric location on the object, then the same system that showed up there can actually make predictions about the sensory input that it's going to sense. It's a little confusing to call it motor related here because it's, it's really a location signal and the location signal is updated by motor. Input. So just think yeah. of it as a point in some space. And this is how we describe this in the, in the neuron paper. Uh, uh, we now, have, just to be clear, we now have a, a more refined idea of how this works. Marcus has been talking about that. So, but, so this is just described what's in that paper, but it's still, the ideas are still correct. The, the concepts are still right, although it's, we think it's actually more different. Yeah, so, so, so can I ask a, go ahead, go ahead Lucas. So you mean it's input from sensors like fusion? It's not like a motor efferent command. That it's not a motor command. At one point we tried that. It doesn't work. That was our little robot arm we did. Um, and the, the big insight was a motor command could work, but it, it, it has a combinatorial explosion problem. The big insight was that it's a location command. It's a pose. It's where the sensor is relative to the object is is the key item, and Initially, no one thought that you could have a representation of where the sensor is relative to the object in the object reference frame. That seems really bizarre, but that's what it is, or that's what this paper speculates it is. And, uh, and that's ultimately updated by movement, these efferent copies of movement command, but the movement command itself is not what's sent in here. It's the location of the sensor. Yeah, and that's really critical. Uh, you can think of it this way. In the sequence memory, there's a location too. It is the ordinal sequence in the, in the sequence. Fourth element, fifth element, sixth element. That is a that is a, a, a reference frame of sorts, right? It's a one D reference. One D reference frame. Here we now have a, like a, a multi dimensional reference frame, and so the exact order in which they come in is not important, but we need to know where in this reference frame uh, the signal is. And what happens when you don't have uh, input from the sensors? Like you're walking around with your eyes closed, but you have that from motor command. Well, you, get, you, 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 you can do that experiment. I've done it many times. Get up in the middle of the night, stand by the other side of your bed, you know where you are, close your eyes, and start walking. Very quickly, you have a lot of uncertainty. Really quickly. And you start getting nervous. Like, uh-oh, I might be walking into a wall here. So, um, so it does do this, uh, this uh, path integration. Right, your, your body takes this moving command and updates your sense of location. You sound like, oh, I now moved away from the edge of the bed. I'm now towards the door of the room. But very quickly, the noise gets really large and you start being uncertain where you are. But if you make, you know, touch, reach out and touch this one thing, you'll often instantly know where you are now. Yeah. And that's because you have a sense of, rough sense of where you are. And by reaching out in, you know, you make a prediction of what you might feel, maybe you make many predictions. If you feel the corner of the bed, not instantly you know where you are in the bedroom. Another simple yeah, example so. of this is really fascinating. You're walking in the dark, and all you see now is the slightest hint of a corner of the wall. And, and if I put this into a vision system, I'd have no idea what it is. But because I know I have a model of the room, that slight hint of the corner of the wall does exactly what Supertide just says. It tells me I know where I am now. And so even the smallest little reflections in your room or little Glimmers or something will anchor you again. Um, so uh, this is why you know computer vision and very like like we have this amazing ability to we think we're seeing things we're not really seeing things we're just re-anchoring our location at times. And maybe one subtle point there is like if you felt the edge of your bed, you might not know exactly where you are because that's still ambiguous. You kind of roughly know where you are, but you don't know. But if you feel the point of your bed. Uh, that's more unique and you'll know instantly where you are. And this algorithm will work the same way. So the, which feature you feel will determine, you know, how, how quickly you can arrive at the location. Yeah, and think of it as a 1D reference frame on top and a multi-dimensional reference frame below. You can think of a 3D, but it's, we have to think about orientation too, so this. And 
And in the 1D reference frame, you can only go in one, in one direction, so you know the, you know the order of, of, of the locations. In the 3D reference frame, the, you don't know the order you're going to go through, but you can, as long as you've got this, as long as someone tells you where you're going to be, or where you have a movement command that updates it, then, then you can build your model in different directions. By, by going to different locations and different orders, as long as you know where you are. So just to recap, in the paper itself, we don't detail the location signal of this paper, and we've talked about it a lot since then, and we can have a separate meeting on that if you want. But in this, in this paper, you can think of it as just an SDR that represents the allocentric location of the sensor of the object. And just to be clear, when, you know, when we say allocentric location, the location is in the reference frame of the object. So if I'm at this point in time, I have a location on, on the edge of my cup here. If I were to completely change my pose and go back there, it's the same location. If I'm further away, even though my joint angles are totally different, it's still the same location on the cup. If I tilt the cup, it's still the same location. Uh, quick question. Um... And I want to keep it brief because I'm excited to get to the rest of this talk, but I need a quick refresher. Uh, so column versus mini column. A cortical column is the set of cells receiving the same sensory input spanning all layers. I know a mini column is a subset of a cortical column, but you said that a mini column is also, all these cells are also responsive to the same sensory input. So is the sensory input oh, no. to the mini column a subset of the sensory input to the whole cortical no, no. column? No, uh, no, just a quick clarification. So. Cortical columns, all everything there receiving the same same sensory input. In a mini column, all the cells have the same uh, recognize the same sensory feature. Okay, so, so that's, that's yeah, the same sensory input is an ambiguous statement. It, they receive info, input from the same patch of skin or patch of retina. That's a cortical column. You can think of it like in vision. One mini column might be representing a vertical edge. The next one might be representing an oblique edge. A uh, few mini columns down, it might be representing a horizontal edge. So they're different features, but it's the same uh, part and portion of the image. Yeah, that is always looking at. perfect. Okay. A mini column, by the way, is a physical thing. It can often be seen under a microscope. It's part of how the brain develops. It is a real thing. And um, uh, as opposed to like the larger column, generally you can't look and see them. There's some exceptions to that. but. Um, and Mountcastle, he said, he actually proposed, and this is kind of perennial confusion to people. He said the algorithmic unit of the cortex is the mini column. And these are very skinny, really skinny little things. And he says uh, several hundred mini columns together form a cortical column, which is really defined by the input they ship. I think what Ben reacted to, and I heard the same thing, was when you were talking about that green arrow going into the sequence memory. You were saying they're all, oh, all those guys are getting the same input. Yeah, yeah. yeah. from the same area of the patch. Uh, okay, that's different, but I heard the same input. Well, in, what they do is they form unique connections to them. So it, the green arrow represents all the inputs from that patch of the sensory organ. Okay. And all those cells could form a connection to that, but they selectively form connections to that. To okay, that, make, that makes more sense. Yeah. I was just seeing this thing going, yeah. doing a fan out to getting, you know, somehow, okay, fine. Yeah, it's interesting, because uh, I think Abhi had a similar confusion yesterday when I was talking to him, and this is the kind of thing that I just don't even think about. It's so natural to me yeah. that I didn't even realize it was that distinction <laughs> and confusion. It's, uh, you can see why, you know, every like every phrase here has like an hour of yeah. they're, discussion. They're, they're loaded. They're loaded. They're concepts. loaded, and it's just you and, have a lot of history. And I would say ninety percent of neuroscientists, roughly, could not give you an articulate definition of a mini column versus a column. I know that sounds crazy, but they don't think about it. They studying something else in the brain. They're studying. I would say it's ninety nine percent. I don't want to insult anyone. Um, it, this is so many things in the brain. You can study that, you know, that's something else, you know. Yeah, I think a lot of, in, in advance, a lot of people will do it by the context in which they've heard it referred to and then form a quick model from that without having studied it in detail. And so that's why you get, you know, the yeah, alpha right. and nine blind yeah. men thing. Yeah. You know, so in the sensory input is just another SDR that's available to the layer. And okay. each neuron will selectively 
uh, you know, phone connections to different. In this, part, in this paper, that sensor, that context represents the location in a reference frame. It could either be the ordinal location in a sequence, or it could be um, um, the cardinal uh, Cartesian coordinate location. Yeah, yeah. I think the only thing I would I would say is that if 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 you're representing saying these are coming from the same patch of skin and multiple things, being di more directly diagrammatic of that rather than the simple unanchored arrow would maybe help uh, anchor it. You can write the next paper. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm referring to it yeah. in terms of uh, in terms of diagrams to, yeah. to try to lower the lower yeah. ambiguity. And the think, other thing I, we could do at some, I mean, in the paper. I wrote down exactly the equations that correspond to everything, and we could just review the equations that there. There's no ambiguity, but it's you know it's actually all notation. There's nothing difficult about the equations. It's just all notations. Right. People who study the neocortex would understand. They're used to these kind of diagrams, and so you have to think about your audience. Um, I don't think that confused neuroscientists who study the neocortex, but I can see why it'd be confusing to other people. Yeah. Well. Was a just quick distinction here. Does the mini column span all the layers or just a subset? Yeah, they, they, it, <laughs> yeah, they do. They span okay. up and down all the layers. So this diagram cool. here is representing one layer. Okay. Right? So within one layer, you'll find like in layer four, you'll see a set of cells, maybe like 10, 15 or something like that, that all responds to the same input. Mm -hmm. And in other layers, they do different things. The actual physical mini column goes across all layers. Okay. But so it's like you can, you can imagine the mini column has got like 120 cells in it, roughly. That's about what it does. It's really skinny. It's like this really teeny little filament. And you can say, oh, these 20 are in one layer, these 20 are in another layer, these 20 are in another layer, these 20 are in another layer. Those layers do different things, but they have a similar architecture. Yeah, so here's a picture from that same paper. Okay. It's a 97 paper. It's like here's one mini column spanning all the layers. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. A mini column might be like 100 microns, where a column might be a millimeter. So they're like a 100. Oh, no, he, he has 20. Well, well it depends. I, I think from one to the next, if you include the spacing, it's yeah. like 80, 50. I, think, I'm just, I was pulling out rough numbers. I think they can, well, they have, it could be as little as 50 and as much as 80. Yeah, that changes a lot by area and species. And yes, that, yes. So, so we, there's no solid rules here. I love the numbering. One, two slash three, four A, four B, four C alpha. <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> well, I can explain that. What happens, this is what happens in neuroscience. <laughs> you start with something simple and it gets complicated. Yeah, I put a new state on there, all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah. And this must be talking about the visual system of um, primates. Is that Others don't have this nomenclature. Okay. Um, anything else? This is good. This is. Uh, I, I mean, I and I should say I'm just going to stop at 11:30, no matter where we are, and we can pick this up at some other point. So. Um, yeah, I also don't want to slow it down. So, yeah, if you're asking for questions. Well, it's important to understand it, and at the end, there's going to be a quiz. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's, that's the way. <laughs> Yeah, so one little technical question I had when I read the paper was these SDRs uh, to represent the location and also the sensory information. Are similar information and locations represented similarly in the SDR? Or is it, because I think in the paper somewhere it said random, but then somewhere it also said that you can kind of interpolate between them. So I just was a bit confused about how they are created. Yeah, I mean, th these would be, you know, outputs of grid cell <laughs> modules, one or more modules. And I mean, the, the nature of this representation is like a whole different. At the time, topic. we yeah. didn't know how this would be created, Vivian. Yeah. And so we just said, well, we don't know. Let's just pick random SDRs to represent each location. Clearly, if, if you're actually sliding between locations on an object, you're gradually moving across the surface, the representation will also gradually move, gradually change. We didn't try to capture that. We didn't have any of this work at the time. So we did a very crude approximation. And we can talk about that maybe at a separate meeting, you know, our, our models of grid cells and, and location signals and so on. 
Uh, but in, in okay, here, but it was just a simple. Here, we're trying to get at the concept of context and representing an input in various contexts and how that could build a model. Uh, sorry, I didn't get that. Your reconnection. Oh, oh, you didn't hear that? She didn't hear that. Yeah. Oh. oh, no, I, I just didn't completely understand what you meant. Uh, well, we're, we're trying to test how, how you could even uh, create the sensory motor models. Um, and we didn't, it doesn't matter too much for the purpose of this model what the nature of the location signal is. Um, oh, just okay, in okay. here, we're just trying to test the, hypo the, the voting algorithm and the, how you even create these. Uh, take Suppose you had a perfect location signal, how would you even use it? Um, there, there are a lot of new ideas in this paper. Um, and, uh, and so lots of them, uh, and, and, yeah. and the previous papers too. We didn't really delve into um, how does this motor related context get created or what does it look like? We didn't, we didn't know at the time, it was just a placeholder. So we picked random SDRs. Maybe I look at okay, that. Okay. But, but this whole yeah. mechanism, how a layer of cells explaining what, why, why the cells in the mini column might have the same feed forward response properties, why they're connected like this, why there's, why the green hour only connects to the proximal synapses and the blue hour connects to the distal synapses. None of that had an explanation. There really were no concrete or theories about how any of this stuff worked. So there's a lot of new ideas here. I mean, that's, we focused on that. We're focusing on those mechanisms in this box. Um, yeah, yeah, it makes totally sense. But uh, I was just wondering, like, in uh, principle, your model should be able to generalize if, if the inputs are in, like, a meaning, meaningful space. So if I have the location here and then here, and then I get a new one in the middle, it, just because of the input having this meaningful relationship, the uh, column model should be able to do something. I don't know if there's a meaningful relationship between the green inputs here. As you move, the, the, the sensory input could change very rapidly, but the location signal would change gradually. Yeah, so, uh, so in, in the sensor, if, for example, illumination gets a bit brighter or a little bit darker, it wouldn't be like very similarly encoded. The train was passing by, right? Yeah, it would be, you could uh, think about like edges, like, you know, neighboring edges, uh, edges that have similar orientations would have over, overlapping sets of mini columns that represent it. That is true, yeah. that's not. Um, Oh, I forgot what I was going to say here. But, uh, <laughs> so this is, oh, this is an explanation of kind of uh, at a high level how the model works. So you have sensory feature coming in the bottom. You have essentially our sequence memory in, except the context signal is this allocentric location signal. And what cells in these mini columns are representing now are features at specific locations. Um, and then we, in this paper, we had a two layer model where um, the, the second layer, what we call the object layer, that performs a pooling operation. Um, and what happens there is that at the lower level, as you move and as you sense new things, um, you're getting completely separate SDRs that are being activated. So it's changing with every movement. Um, whereas at the top, you're pooling across all of the features uh, across an object and you will get an SDR that's stable over the movement of the sensor as long as you're sensing the same object. So for a given, it's going to represent the object that you're sensing. So if I'm moving around, in, if I stick my hand in the black box and I'm sensing a coffee cup, uh, the object layer is going to have a single SDR that represents that coffee cup. It's going to be stable, whereas the bottom layer is going to change as I move my finger around. I don't know if that was clear to anyone. And so with this location input, a single cortical column can learn models of a complete object by integrating and sense pooling across 
all of the different locations on an object over time. So if I'm learning about, if I've never sensed a coffee cup and I'm learning about it, I can, yeah, I can uh, associate all of the different sensory inputs at the different locations with a single SDR that's at the top. In this paper, that is the definition of an object, right? The definition of an object is a thing that has features at various locations. We no longer believe that's completely true. It's slightly different than that, but that was the paper. It's the same idea. It's how is it different now? Because we don't longer believe that we we're learning features at locations. We derive the models actually as features relative to each other. And we build that model by knowing where my finger is relative to those features. So we do need to know where the finger is relative to the feature or relative to the object, excuse me. We need to know where the finger is relative to the object, but the actual model that's built is not a collection of feature, object, feature, feature, location, feature, location. It is feature relative to feature relative to feature. This is the, the graph that Marcus has been talking about. But for now, we can ignore that. It just, it's a, it's an important subtlety, but it's, I'm just trying to be concrete. Yeah. So in the, in the one case, it would be like a bag of features, but now you add that the relationship. It's, it's with not a bag of features. No, 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 exactly, exactly. Yeah, if you yeah. didn't have the location signal yeah. at all, right. then in, in this case, you would just accumulate a bag of features. So right. a pointy thing, a, a flat thing, a curvy thing. And that's it. And that can, if you change the rearrangement of those, you wouldn't know the difference. Right. But once you have a location signal, whether it's allocentric location or the relative location, then then you know it's not a bag of features anymore. Right. Right. And in the paper, we actually tested against bag of features as the default model. The whole point is this reference frame provides structure to the yeah. data, so it's it's not a bag. Yeah. Right. right. It's structured data. Yeah. But, I mean, but without it, in this thing, you would just yeah. get a pure value. I mean, the way you describe it, there's not even necessarily a common reference. They're all to be relative to each other, and that hangs together regardless. Yeah, exactly. OK. That becomes, then the model, the, the, the graph model? Yeah. Yeah, then the model becomes independent. Um, anyway, it, it, yeah, enough said. It, it, the model now becomes, it's sort of self-referential. Yeah, it's the more robust. Of features. Oh, it's, yeah, it, it solves a lot of problems. I have a, a quick clarification. So when I first read this paper and I was looking at what's going on in the pooling layer um, and I guess what you might call the output SDR, um, I was having a hard time grasping it because I just thought, well, how is a single SDR a model of a complete object? And it seems like maybe the idea here is that one SDR emerges in response to lots of different combinations of inputs. And so it's not quite right to say that the SDR represents the object. It's more like the SDR in pairing with what's happening in the earlier layers. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it represents the object, but it isn't the model. The model is in the lower layer here. Yeah, so think of this as a unique pointer to a data structure that describes the object. No, that's the exactly right, the... because I had in my notes exactly, is this SDR acting like a pointer? So that's perfect. That's what it is. Yeah. But it can do things that pointers can't do, which I'll get to. But anyway, it's a it's a you can like a you can learn a model without knowing a name for it. Um, and and often you don't always have to have um, a stable representation for it, uh, but you can still know it. It's like it's like recognizing a, a melody but not knowing the name of the melody. You can still recognize the melody, and, and you can say, I don't know what the name of that is. I don't need the name. Yeah. OK, I'll walk through one example that's in the paper. Uh, so I think this is like the simplest example I could think of here. Um, suppose there are two different objects, uh, this cube and this prism thing, um, wedge. Um, and let's say the top one has three different features. F1 is this little corner here. F3 is this other corner, and F2 is this vertical line here. The wedge has also three features. F1 and F3 are shared, so they're both little points here. And then F4 is a diagonal uh, plane here, and so that's a different feature. Okay, so it has one unique feature and two shared features with the, the, this guy. 
Um, and suppose in the object layer, uh, this SDR here represents the cube. And then this SDR here, completely separate SDR, represents the wedge. Okay. And then at the bottom, we have is four separate uh, representations for each feature that denotes which mini columns uh, correspond to this feature. So F1 has these mini columns so <laughs> representing each feature. Um, F2 has these mini columns representing that feature and so on. Okay, so they're completely separate. You know, there could be some shared bits like here, uh, these two mini columns are shared, but the pattern uh, is unique for, for each feature. Okay, so here's what might happen after the first sensation. So let's say you reach out, again, you're going into this dark black box and you're touching something with a single fingertip. And so you sense feature one, okay? Um, and so the sensory input that comes in corresponds to these many columns that become active. What you get at the output layer here now, you don't know which object it is because feature one is shared across these two objects. So what you'll get at the output layer is a union of these two SDRs. Okay, so you get the R of those two SDRs uh, active there. And then with these, uh, with this SDR through this feedback connection, you can now predict all possible sensory inputs that are consistent with both SDRs here. So now you're gonna, in here, you're gonna predict, um, you know, all of these features at specific locations. So that's what would happen after the first uh, touch. After the second touch, let's say you touch F2 here. Um, now F2 is unique. So at this point, only some of these predictions are gonna be consistent uh, with this new sensation. And what's gonna happen is um, at, the, at the output layer, uh, the union is gonna get rapidly narrowed down to the set of objects that are consistent with both F1 and F2. And again, I haven't described the algorithm yet. I'm just telling you what's gonna happen. And so once you rec do F2, you will now converge on a single uh, representation of the object and it through these feedback connections are gonna make a much narrower set of predictions about what you're gonna feel. And then the third sensation here F3, the, the output layer is going to stay converged on that single representation of the object, even though F3 on its own is ambiguous. Remember that F3 was in both of these objects. But now that we've coalesced onto this representation of the object, even when you send something that on its own would be ambiguous, the representation at the top stays focused on, on, on the particular unique uh, object identity or the SDR. Okay, so that the questions here is this. Um, okay, as I was describing it, I, I started thinking of, and what I'm saying is, is ambiguous, but uh, hopefully it was clear enough. That was great. Okay, here's another representation of the exact same thing. This is a, a video created by our own Louis Shanklin. <laughs> um, so imagine this coffee cup is in some black box again, and you're, uh, there's some more subtleties about that's coming in, into this uh, description here. I'm gonna move my fingertip, or this fingertip is gonna move and, so, and sense something. Okay, so it's moving towards this guy here. and. So it's predicting the location. It's predicting the allocentric location. So imagine there's some, some system somewhere that's taking that movement command and doing a reference frame transformation and converting it into a location that represents this 3D location on in the reference frame of the cup. Okay. And how that actually happens is a topic of the stuff that we're discussing and in, in, in what you know Jeff talks about as we call that reference frame transformations. So here, imagine you're making this movement and you have this transformation and now you can predict the location that's going to be on the in the reference frame of that cup. So that movement signal happens before you ever get sensory input, right? So that location is gets sent in before you get the actual sensory input. And if you've already 
learn the object, this signal, this SDR, gets recognized by some set of distal dendritic segments on these neurons, and those neurons will be put into a predictive state, like we talked about last, last week. And so you'll have some set of signals that you are predicting will happen. Um, so now let's say you touch it, you, you get an actual sensory input. That sensory input is gonna be a subset of all the ones that you predicted. Because in the beginning, you don't know what object it is, so you're predicting a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and, but you get an actual sensory input coming in corresponding to the side of that coffee cup. And so these cells will now become active, will inhibit everything else. These predictions will just die away. So these, these cells will stay active. This in turn will get be fed to the next level. And now all of the cells that are consistent with with the sensory input at that location will, will be, become active. And let's say there are three separate objects that are consistent with that. So you'll get a union of three different objects at the output layer. And this coffee cup, the soda can, and the tennis ball. Okay, let's say they all have this curved sensation and um, with one touch, you don't know which, you've eliminated everything else, but you don't know which of these three it is yet. Okay, so now, the, you're gonna make another movement to the edge of this thing. During that time, the output layer stays active. Okay, it remains active. You're now predicting a different set of sensory inputs. Um, you get the actual sensory input that comes in. It's gonna be a subset of all the ones that you predict. Um, and then that gets fed to the next layer. And now only the cells that were previously active, they reinforce each other. Um, that are previously active and consistent with the new input, those are the ones that are going to win the competition. They have the strongest input. Um, what I've neglected to mention here is uh, during learning, you're going to form associations between all of the cells that correspond to the same object. Okay, so they're sort of reinforcing each other. Uh, plus, you get sensory input, the actual sensed uh, feature location pair from the previous layer coming in, and so only the cells that have both lateral support and support from below are gonna stay on. The rest are gonna be inhibited. Okay, so this is like a, a temporal K winner take all. It's gonna, it's gonna take the cells which have the most evidence from the past as well as from the present, those are gonna stay active. You can think of it this way, two of those three objects have the same features at the below the positions on the other objects. So they're both still in the running. Yeah. So this guy, they both have curved things on the side, and they both have like a lip or an edge at the top, like there. That's what it's supposed to be. No, dumb question. How do you decide where you need to move your finger to in order to get you know, the best? You don't have to think about that here. We're not addressing that. You issue. don't have to. You can just randomly move about, and you'll still work. Um, uh, there's a separate question of how would I optimize this? Or, you know, why would I move one way or the other? Uh, at this point, um, one, you could imagine the column would say, you might think, oh, well, now I, have the, I, I think it could be a coffee cup or a can, I should move here to make a differentiation. Yeah, maybe if you move to the immediately to the right, you would sense that you could sense the handle and that would immediately get you. But we're not we're not getting close to that. We're just saying it doesn't matter, you're moving, you're, you're touching, you're moving, you're touching, the system will now run on the, um, the correct answer. Pretty sure for example, it could be randomly moving like a circuit just touching the same place. But it's not going to be very useful with it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so don't do that. Um, I mean that's a separate question. We're just talking about the mechanisms by how movement sensation can infer what object you're touching over time. Yeah, we're not talking about you know what actually generates this, um, but yeah, but your intuition is right. I mean, if you can feel as something really unique, uh, then you would instantly uh, you know, coalesce onto that object. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we'll take a third motion uh, to the edge there and same thing's gonna happen. You're gonna predict uh, the feature location pairs down here. Uh, that's going to, what you'll actually sense will be a subset of that. Um, 
and those cells are going to become active through the same mechanism we talked about last week. That output gets fed above, and the exact same mechanism I talked about a minute ago is going to now narrow down into a unique SDR that represents just this copy cup. So the cells which had support from the previous iteration through lateral connections plus the incoming input, those are the cells that will be the strongest, will fire strongly or, or quickly and will inhibit everything else and that SDR will stay constant. So it's, it's again, it's very similar to what I talked about before. It's, it's dendritic segments causing predictions and winner take all, except there's a little more of a temporal component here. There's some stability to the activations in the alpha player. That's the only difference. Okay, maybe this is a good time to stop since it's 11.27. Because <laughs> um, okay. now we're gonna move on to multiple columns and it's gonna be almost identical to what I just described, except now you're gonna have connections. So I see what you're talking In this case, you can think of it's like voting over time. I yeah. One yeah. vote from one sensory input, I get another vote from another sensory input, I get another vote from another sensory, you know, sensory temporal sensory input. And so the column is sort of voting over time to decide what, what hypothesis or what underlying object is consistent with all those votes. And then the next stage is you can have multiple columns doing the same thing, but they can vote amongst themselves as well. Yeah. So they eliminate possibilities by voting uh, coincidentally as opposed to sequentially. Yeah. The really beautiful thing I like is that you think about just from a single neuron's perspective, it's, it's basically the exact same thing I talked about last week. The single neuron is just getting inputs coming in from all over the place and it's integrating it into the, and there's this K winner take off circuit. That's really at the end of it, that's all that's going on. It's very simple. It's just the way you connect it up and um, the way you create these networks lead to very, very different functions and very powerful functions. Um, but if you look at a level of a, just a single neuron, what's going on is really simple. Um, well, we have the capacity to, you know, black box, touch, wait five seconds, touch, five seconds. I mean, in other words, we can retain that beyond what we normally consider how these things be activated. So something is regenerating. Uh, that maybe. Yeah, I mean, there's some stability that's going on in that output layer. Right? Yeah, so, I, yeah, I wouldn't get hung up on that kind of stuff. It's like, you know, if you reach your hand in the black box and touch something and then walk away and come back later and reach your hand in the back box, you probably want to the validity of the integration of those. Um, um, and I, there's this kind of idea, well, what if I had sort of like a, um, um, a working memory I'm keeping, I'm, I'm thinking about it, but not moving anything for a while. That's like a separate issue. Most of the time, you don't realize you're doing this at all. I could reach over to my side here and pick up this coffee cup. I even know I'm picking up a coffee cup, but I may not even know where it is. Oops, it's not over. Um, and so, you know, I touch something and I touch it again. And all of a sudden, I know not only what it is, but where it is relative to me. And so, you know, most of the time, these are very flowing, non-thoughtful, not thinking about it. It's just, you're doing this every waking second, every time you touch anything. It, you're essentially right, doing right. the same process. I'm, not, I'm saying use the mechanism of more or less this recognition, but I'm, I'm looking at, there is there is a mechanism there where we can somehow regenerate the, and bring it back in again. It's separate. It doesn't have yeah, to be. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just thinking it's not the main it's not the main way we do it. it, it you know, there is this idea of working memory. You could keep something in mind while you're trying to right. But I mean it, it's it's I kind of like it to how we do certain creative thoughts is that we're able to pull things together and, and at the moment this thing is more somatic, excuse me, more um, intrinsic. So and we want to understand that. But I, I think it's 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 marvelous that we do have that latitude to be able to. Yeah. Yeah, we kind of sometimes call those active predictions. They're still predictions, but we can, they're not internal to the cell. We can actually cause activity to happen. It, it, exactly. But if you can, conceptually, it's the same thing. Right. They're right, still right. predictions. I mean, some of those connections floating are probably helping to do yeah. that. Yeah, I hope I tried to convey that kind of the simplicity of it all at the end. Underneath it, and that's one of the reasons why I think we, should, we need to focus a lot on the neuron model and how to really think about the neuron model. The same thing with learning; it's very simple. At the end of the day, it's just local to the neuron. The underlying it's operations funny. are very simple. It's like, yeah. Maybe, yeah, but the whole thing is pretty damn complex. It's complex, but yeah. <laughs> um, uh, 
it's like, you know, a Turing machine is really simple, but an operating system is super complex. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's a Turing yeah. machine. Well, there's, there's intricacies, let's put it that way, right? Yeah. Uh, but anyway, um, of course, I don't mean to say that details are not important. It's just, uh, I, I'd like to also think of it as being, at the end of the day, kind of simple. <laughs>